Tonight, India's independence. Prime Minister Narendra Modi addresses the Indian populace with pride on beginning a golden era. Three years on, the Taliban puts on a parade celebrating their hold on Afghanistan in what is a grim remembrance of the rest of the globe on fateful loss of control. Global emergency. The WHO declares the Mpox outbreak in Africa a cause for worldwide concern, sounding its highest possible alarm over the worsening situation. Possum Puffs A healing time at yoga just got better with the help of some furry friends. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Adha Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Sanuvi Mudanayaka. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News this Thursday evening. We have lots of updates to bring to you tonight, starting with the Independence Day celebrations in India. Prime Minister Narendra Modi addressing the nation on the 78th Independence Day from the ramparts of the iconic Red Fort said his dream of making India a developed nation by 2047 is a reflection of the resolve and dreams of the country's 140 crore people. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi said the country was entering its golden era and hopes to achieve the goal of a developed India by 2047. He was addressing a crowd of thousands during Independence Day celebrations at the 17th century Red Fort in New Delhi. Modi told attendees that even when they see it in terms of global conditions, this is a golden era and they must use this opportunity to walk with dreams and determination to build a better India. Modi also addressed the fatal landslides which killed over 200 in the coastal state of Kerala, saying the sudden surge in natural calamities was concerning and the recent tragedy is a loss for the entire nation. Thousands of women marched across India overnight as anger escalated over the rape and murder of a doctor in the eastern part of the country. Without naming the West Bengal government and the rape and murder of a doctor in Kolkata, Prime Minister Narendra Modi flagged the issue of women's safety. Protests took place in cities such as Kolkata, where the 31-year-old doctor was found dead last Friday. Police said she had been raped and murdered and a police volunteer was subsequently arrested in connection with the crime. On the streets of Kolkata on Wednesday night, protesters held candles and posters that said reclaim the night. Clashes also broke out in the city between protesters and security personnel in the early hours of today. During India's Independence Day commemoration ceremony, Prime Minister Narendra Modi called for strict punishment for crimes against women, saying it is important to instill confidence in society. Afghanistan's Taliban rulers celebrated three years in power yesterday with a military parade. Taliban forces seized the capital Kabul after the US-backed government collapsed and its leaders fled into exile. At Bagram Air Base, once the symbolic seat of US military power in Afghanistan, the Taliban celebrated three years in power Wednesday. A military parade complete with armored personnel carriers captured from the former US-backed government as well as the Taliban's more traditional conveyances. For many in the country, though, the Taliban's return has meant anything but freedom. On August 15, 2021, their fighters rolled into Kabul as the U.S.-backed government collapsed after years of corruption, mismanagement and defeat at the hands of a two-decade insurgency. A chaotic U.S. military withdrawal quickly followed marked by a suicide bombing at Bagram Air Base that killed 13 U.S. troops and some 170 Afghans. The intervening years have been devastating for women's rights especially. The fundamentalist government has banned girls' education beyond the sixth grade, mandated the wearing of the burqa in public, and advised women to stay home altogether. Meanwhile, the Afghan economy is in crisis, worsened by a ban on most female employment, Foreign aid accounts for some 30% of the country's GDP. Despite not being officially recognized by any country, the Taliban have scored some recent diplomatic wins, as Pakistan, China, Russia and Iran have all established de facto relations in recent months. 
The governor of Russian border area of Belgorod has declared a region-wide state of emergency, saying the situation is extremely difficult. The move comes as Ukrainian forces continue their incursion into Russia, where Kiev says it has taken control of 74 settlements in the neighboring Kursk region. The governor of Russia's border region of Belgorod, Vyacheslav Gladkov, declared a state of emergency on Wednesday, saying Ukrainian shelling is making the situation extremely difficult and tense by destroying homes and killing civilians. The declaration came after Belgorod began evacuations on Monday as a result of Ukrainian advances following Kyiv's surprise incursion into the neighboring Kursk region last week. According to Reuters, regional authorities are now appealing to the Russian government to declare a federal emergency. Kiev says it has captured 74 villages in the Kursk region and has vowed to stop its offensives in Russia if Moscow agrees to a fair peace deal. Ukraine continued to push ahead with its offensive in Russia's Kursk region for the eighth day on Tuesday. A top Ukrainian commander said that its forces were able to advance three kilometers in one day, taking control of an additional 40 square kilometers of Russian territory. AFP News reported that Ukraine is in control of at least 800 square kilometers of mainland of Russia after analyzing resources from Institute of the Study of War. However, Moscow says it's in the process of pushing back the Ukrainian military. The Russian Defense Ministry says Ukraine has already lost up to 420 troops in the past 24 hours, and over 2,000 soldiers have been killed since the incursions began last Tuesday. While the Ukrainian foreign ministry called on Russia to agree to restore peace in the two-and-a-half-year-long war, Russian President Vladimir Putin a day earlier said no negotiations could happen with those that attack civilians and civilian infrastructure, slamming the eight-day-long incursion. The World Health Organization has declared a global public health emergency following an outbreak of the Mpox virus in Africa. The WHO had been monitoring a surge in cases in the Congo. The new variant has spread to Burundi, Kenya, Rwanda and Uganda. The infection can be passed on through close contact. It causes flu-like symptoms and liaisons on the body. The World Health Organization on Wednesday declared NPOX a global public health emergency for the second time in two years. The alert comes after an outbreak of the viral infection in the Democratic Republic of Congo spread to neighboring countries. NPOX, which is usually mild, can spread through close contact and in rare cases be fatal. It causes flu-like symptoms and pus-filled lesions on the body. The outbreak in the Congo began with the spread of an endemic strain known as Clade 1 but a new variant, Clade 1B, appears to spread more easily through routine close contact, including sexual contact. It has spread from the Congo to neighboring countries including Burundi, Kenya, Rwanda, and Uganda, triggering the action from the WHO. Tedros said on Wednesday that the WHO had released $1.5 million in contingency funds and plans to release more in the coming days. WHO's response plan would require an initial $15 million and the agency plans to appeal to donors for funding. Let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. On the road to the White House, there is scrutiny on both sides tonight as the Trump campaign is facing backlash for a social media post while Tim Walz is facing criticism for saying he was the first union member on a presidential ticket since Ronald Reagan. Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump lobbed a series of personal and policy-based attacks at his Democratic rival Kamala Harris at a rally. Speaking to supporters in Asheville, North Carolina, Trump steered clear of broadsides challenging Harris's racial identity and spoke about policy in more detail than he has at other recent events. Since emerging as the Democratic Party's candidate after President Joe Biden dropped his re-election bid last month, Harris has dramatically changed the race. Polls have consistently shown her closing the gap on Trump and some now have her ahead in the race for the November 5th election. The surge has rattled Trump's campaign but supporters are confident that he will pull ahead due to serious lapses in the harris Walls attack strategy.
The Columbia University president stepped down nearly four months after the university faced criticism from both pro-Israel and pro-Palestine groups over its handling of campus protests related to the Israel's war in Gaza. She's the third president of a major U.S. university to step down after protests over Gaza. Shafiq said in an announcement that, quote, it has also been a period of turmoil where it has been difficult to overcome divergent views across our community. This period has taken a considerable toll on my family, as it has for others in our community. She also said stepping down would help Colombia navigate future challenges better, and that she made the announcement early so new leadership could start before the next term begins. Protesters have vowed to continue protests after the new term begins on September 3rd. The protests in April and May engulfed parts of Colombia's campus, rallying in opposition to civilian deaths in Gaza. Shafiq was criticized by both sides, protesters for calling police to end the demonstrations, which led to hundreds of arrests and pro-Israel supporters for not taking stronger action. After protesters set up tents and demanded the university sell its Israeli assets, officials tried to negotiate an agreement to dismantle the camps. When talks failed, Shafiq asked New York police to enter the campus on April 18th, which angered many rights groups, students and faculty. In addition to the arrest, the tents were removed, but they returned soon after. The university called the police again on April 30th, leading to further arrests, both at Columbia and nearby City College of New York. She then asked the police to stay until May 17th, two days after graduation, to keep order and prevent the tents from being set up again. Republican Representative Elise Stefanik, who has been a critic of university leaders in congressional hearings about the protest, welcomed Shafiq's resignation on X, calling it overdue for her failure to protect Jewish students during the Gaza protest. Hurricane Ernesto battered Puerto Rico as a Category 1 hurricane yesterday, leaving more than half the island without power. The storm is now making its way towards Bermuda. Tropical storm Ernesto strengthened into a Category 1 hurricane on Wednesday after unleashing torrential rain and cutting power to hundreds of thousands of residents in Puerto Rico. Ernesto left downed power lines in its wake as the hurricane churned northwest of San Juan, packing winds of about 75 miles per hour. The fifth named Atlantic storm of the season, Ernesto, is forecast to approach Bermuda by Saturday, with rainfall beginning as early as Thursday. A storm is considered a hurricane when its sustained winds reach 74 miles per hour. It's possible Ernesto could still become a major hurricane, Category 3 or higher, over the next 48 hours, according to the National Hurricane Center. That would put its sustained wind speed at at least 111 miles per hour. Many public buildings were closed Wednesday in both Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands, with the Hurricane Center warning that floodwaters were covering some streets and causing mudslides. Ernesto is the second named Atlantic storm in a week after slow-moving Debbie hit Florida's Gulf Coast before soaking some parts of the Carolinas. Hurricane Beryl, the first of the season, was the earliest recorded Category 5 hurricane on record in the Atlantic when it swept through the Caribbean and the U.S. Gulf Coast last month, killing dozens of people and costing an estimated $6 billion in damages. France remembers the 1944 Allied lands in Provence, an event overshadowed by the Normandy landings two months earlier, but still key to the World War II endgame in Europe. On August 15, 1944, hundreds of thousands of Allied soldiers landed between Toulon and Caen on the French Riviera. Their objective was to recapture the strategic port cities of Toulon and Marseille, which had been occupied by the Nazis, and to back up the Allied troops that had landed in Normandy 70 days earlier. Some 350,000 troops landed along approximately 100 kilometres of coastline. The Germans were quickly overwhelmed by the scale of the attack. Most of the soldiers were unfamiliar with the area. They were part of the Free French Soldiers and came from overseas colonies in Africa, an aspect that is little known to many who visit this memorial museum in Toulon. Toulon and Marseille were liberated earlier than planned on the 26th and 28th of August. 
A study using data from NASA's Mars InSight lander shows evidence of liquid water far below the surface of the fourth planet, advancing the search for life there and showing what might have happened to Mars's ancient oceans. New evidence of liquid water far below the surface on Mars is giving insight into what might have happened to Mars's ancient oceans. The lander on the red planet since 2018 measured seismic data over four years. It examined how quakes shook the ground and determined what materials or substances were beneath the surface. Based on that, researchers found liquid water was most likely present about 7 to 12 miles below. The study hypothesizes that the amount of water could have filled ancient oceans on Mars. Water would be a vital resource if humans ever establish some sort of long-term settlement. But directly studying the water that deep beneath the surface is unlikely. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news right after this. Welcome back. For yogis looking for some puppy love with their mindfulness, a yoga class in Los Angeles offers gentle stretching alongside nine puppies, many of them looking for permanent homes. As practitioners work through a series of asanas or poses, pups assist by jumping on the backs of those in cat-cow pose and scrambling underneath the elevated bodies of those in downward dog. According to Los Angeles-based Laughing Frog Yoga Studio, they are one of the very first and few studios offering puppy yoga in Southern California since 2019. Dog wrangler and foster pup mom Julie Mondin said the cast provides many mental health benefits for students like happiness, joy and socialization. They said most of the adopted puppies are on surrenders or rescues from shelters and to date around 58 puppies have been adopted through the class. Laughing Frog Yoga also offers goat and kitten yoga but nothing compares to the delight puppies bring. And with that, we mark the end of today's bulletin. We'll see you again tomorrow with the latest happenings across the globe. Stay tuned as Anuradha Vikram Singh will join you next with the nightly business report. Thank you for watching. Good night.